Well, happy April 1st, and greetings from my little perennial herb bed here, and, or perennial vegetable bed, more likely. Sorrel's doing great, but what I really want to show you is hiding here underneath this pot. And this is sea kale, so crambe maritima. Here's one growing outside of the pot. And then underneath, we have our blanched sea kale. And so blanching is a process of excluding light from the leaves, and so it forces a vegetable to grow tall and pale. So you see this done a lot with uh, the white asparagus, but you can also do it with other things like sea kale. Ah, there it is! How fun. So it's a bit of a dirty mess and looking a little <laughs> flotsam and jetsam there, but um, well, there you go, blanched sea kale. And so sea kale goes way, way back. It's a native to the shores of England and then also the Black Sea, perhaps. Gerard mentions it, puts it in with all the other cabbages in his late 1500s herbals and talks about it, cooking it just um, with all the other cabbages, just a different type of cabbage. And it's not until we get into kind of everything, until the later 1600s that we see it. Um, John Evelyn mentions in it in his Discords of Salads, and then later on into the 1700s is when it is kind of brought from the wild and first recorded as cultivation and this actual forcing. And they had all sorts of fancy forcing pots and everything like that, and then it got really popular in the Victorian era and uh, both wild harvesting it. And in the wild, it does blanch like this because it grows on the coastal dunes. And so the sand will cover it up and then you can dig it out and gather up these things. And uh, a lot of people say you can cook it like asparagus. Um, let's see what else. Uh, and then otherwise, it's really tasty. Um, these are a little bit dirty to eat out in the field, but I think I'll give it a whirl. This one looks, no, oh, that one's not very clean. <laughs> Which is the cleanest one. Here, we'll go for this right here and give it a taste test. All right, so taste test of sea kale. I'm gonna do both blanched and unblanched. Oh, hello, little ones. Um, so the unblanched one here, nice green. It is almost succulent in how thick it is. Um, kind of, you know, you can definitely tell it's something that was designed to grow on the coasts because it could hold a lot of water. Oh. And that's lovely. It has a really fun, like, um, thick crunch to it. Not thick as in, um, like, tough and nasty, but thick as in just very toothsome, uh, in a, in a good toothsome kind of way. It has a light flavor of ca cabbage, but not overpowering. It's just very light. It, it, it would add a really fun texture to a salad, but not too much taste. So that's cool. I wonder what the stem is like. Oh, the stem's a little stringy. But, other than that, it's pretty good. All right, onward to my slightly dirty, but hopefully still tasty, blanched sea kale. Oh! Oh my goodness. So that texture is totally different. It is light and crispy. Uh, kind of like that really juicy crunchiness that you get. Oh, there's a bluebird. Hello. Uh, the light crunchiness that you can get with a celery without the strings on it, but no celery flavor whatsoever. Mmm, almost like a water chestnut kind of texture to it. Doesn't really taste anything like kale. Just very, very light kale flavor. This is really fun. I, I'm, yes, yes. Sea kale blanched is totally a thing. I can understand now why this got to be so popular. This is really tasty. Um, so there are some books um, closer to the Victorian times, I believe. Um, Miss Beaton mentions uh, cooking it like you would asparagus, uh, boiled in with butter. But wow, this is really delightful. I would totally just cut this up to add little crunchy happiness to a salad. That is just... all right. Sea kale for the win. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to harvest um, a few more of these stalks. Whoops, I just took the tip off of that. I hope that doesn't damage it. Um, and so they say that for older established sea kales that you can actually force um, two harvests out of it. 
and you can start the process as early as December by placing a terracotta pot over it and then piling, well that one's a little green, I'm going to leave that, uh, piling horse dung around it, or I'm sure any kind of manure, really. So you're creating and utilizing that manure to, oh my goodness, look, this is actually a really good amount of food that is being produced. Anyway, uh, so you can put um, horse dung around it, and then with the decomposition of the horse dung, it increases heat temperatures and tricks the plant into growing uh, before the season starts. And so it's a, another fun way that you can have an extended harvest season. So these have been here, even though the plants themselves are a few years old, I only transplanted these. Um, you can see how thick and nubbly these are. Um, I need to get some more soil on this one. But uh, I only transplanted the, these guys are a few years old. I transplanted these last year. So they've only been in the ground a year. Um, so I am only gonna do one harvest and not a complete harvest. And what will happen is you can already see some of these guys are starting to turn green. But um, as the day progresses, these will just start to figure out that it is time to start producing chlorophyll. And so they will actually green up and over the course of a week, they'll go from this kind of pale yellow color to this dark green fleshy stuff. And then they'll continue to grow throughout the year. They are wonderfully drought tolerant, but come the summer, their leaves get really tough and much more uh, distinctly cabbagey. So still very edible. The flowers are beautiful. These big white clusters of flowers. Um, and then they produce these round seed pods. Uh, that float in water, which makes sense since they're a maritime species. So there is sea kale. How fun. Uh, I hope you have a lovely day. I'm going to go cook up my sea kale, part of it to have with eggs and the other part to have with a salad later on today. All right, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.